All right, we are going to get started here. Just a couple things. We'll just call it uh, housekeeping things before we get rolling. Uh, I have <clears throat> had several people ask for different things at different times of like, hey, what did you say at this point in time or what was that list that you gave? And so this is not like Sunday morning church. This is different and we want it to be different. So if you guys have questions, you can throw up a hand and I will probably <laughs> Uh, say, uh, yeah, we got time for it. Um, or if you're just like, hey, I missed that, can you repeat it? Don't be afraid to just ask. It's okay, like this is not like you'd be interrupting a Sunday morning sermon. This is different. Uh, this is intentionally less formal than that. We want it that way. So if you're there, that's okay. And we're good with that. That was one of the things I had several people ask about last week was the list of uh, evaluation questions about idolatry. And so I just put those up on the board for you, hoping that maybe uh, that would be helpful to you. And again, if you're too afraid to ask too, just ask me after the class. I'm happy to do that. Shoot, I'll send you my notes. I don't care. You can have them. Um, but I uh, just wanted to get that out there. So again, if you have questions, don't be afraid to ask, even in the middle of where we're going. And if you didn't hear something, if I talk too fast, it's usually because I'm trying to cover too much content. Uh, so we're going to trim back a little bit on my notes every week, and we'll see what happens. But we're going to pray, and uh, we will jump in here. Father God, we, we just want to, to come into this time ready to hear from your word. God, the reality is, is that as we are looking to learn how to make better disciples, as we're looking to learn how do we love one another well in a unique way that's outside of our comfort zone, that for a lot of us, this is new. For a lot of us, this is something that we've, we've heard about, but, but to truly step into this thing can be kind of scary. To truly step into to knowing one another deeply and to being known deeply goes against so much of what we're naturally comfortable with. And so God, I just pray that in some ways, you would just open us up to how you would have us live as your church. God, that as we, as we look at passages that you've given us in Scripture, as we uh, look at just helpful information, that, that it would be eye-opening for us, that it would be convicting for us. And God, like we've prayed each week before, that for different people here, myself included, some of the stuff we're covering is stuff that is going to hit close to home. Some of it is going to be struggles that we might be dealing with on a daily basis. And so, God, we pray that each of us here would be open to the work that you want to do in our hearts first. That we might love others well because you have. We ask this in your just holy and precious name. Amen. Uh, quickly for review. So the way that review will kind of work each week, I'll touch base on a couple key things from the week before. I'm not going to go back to the beginning. And so if you're like, hey, I missed two weeks ago, those recordings are up on YouTube and on uh, Facebook and on the website. You can definitely get those. Uh, but for tonight, we're just going to quickly touch base on a couple things from last week. Last week, we were talking about drawing out the heart. And we were looking at Proverbs chapter 20, verse 5, the idea of the purposes of a man's heart are like deep waters, but a man of understanding will draw them out. And the difficulty of understanding that, that to get to the heart of a person, and, and that starts with ourselves, it's hard. The reality that, that a lot of times we'll say things and do things and we haven't actually even wrestled through for ourselves what our actual motivations are in the moment. That there will be times where we're expressing anger or disappointment or, or depression or anxiety and fear or worry. And we don't even know where it's coming from. We talk through just the reality that culture has this view of the heart as though that it should be this guide for our lives, that, that it should lead us and that we should trust it and go where it wants us to go, but that Scripture says something very different about the heart. That in Jeremiah 17, God says in His Word that the heart is desperately sick and wicked. Now, who could know it? But that it answers the question for us, God does. That God is cardianostes. He is the heart knower. And so he knows us fully. He understands all of our motivations and what drives us to do the things that we do. 
We talk through the reality that, that for us, the heart really isn't this uh, Valentine's Day shaped thing or, or this thing that's all about feelings, but it's, it's kind of the inner essence ultimately of who we are when scripture is talking about the heart. It's what drives your motivations. It's kind of what makes you do what you do because it's what you want. It's that thing that you just feel in your guts. We went to Luke chapter 6, and we looked at Jesus' teaching about, about the tree and the fruit. And I'm not going to redraw it here because my drawing's bad, and uh, hopefully the description's enough. But we talked through the reality that when you have a tree, if you walk up to it, you should be able to tell what kind of tree it is by the fruit that's on it. And that's not my argument or somebody else's argument. That's Jesus' argument from Luke chapter 6. He says that a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. He says, if you go up to a tree that has figs on it, you should expect it to have figs. But if you go up to a tree of briars, you should not expect figs. And the whole idea is this. The fruit on a tree is going to reveal to you what's actually going on at the heart of it. The fruit of a tree is going to reveal what's coming from the roots. And if you just try to deal with fruit things, those fruit sins that we talked about, of, of maybe it's things like anger or lust or greed or control, or anxiety, or depression, or all of these different things, if all we try to do is pick that fruit off to make it go away, eventually it's going to come back. That we can pick all of the fruit off of a tree and do really well for a little while, but that next season we should expect we go back to that tree to find more of the same fruit. Because we didn't change the tree, we just removed something from it temporarily. We just did behavior modification. We talked about the reality that, that any of us can change behavior for a short time, but lasting change is something that occurs in the heart. It occurs at the root level, and it's the only way that we see lasting change. So we ask the question, so then how do you actually get to the root? Like, I've been struggling with the same sin problem for 15 years, and, and I, I beat it for a little while, but it just keeps coming back. So how do I actually do something about this? And so we talked through a couple ways that you can actually start digging into your own heart. That with God's help, that you can start working to see what is going on in my heart. What are my motivations? And, and once we start to learn to do that, it helps us to be able to do that well with other people. We looked at Ezekiel chapter 14 and, and the story about the priests in Israel who go to Ezekiel and God says to them, I'm not going to speak to you because you're bringing to me the idols that you have set up in your heart. And the idols that are in your heart have become a stumbling block before your face. And it's this description of these guys who they think they're doing the right things. They're doing all of this religious stuff. But the reality is, is that they've set that stuff up as idols. They don't actually remember that they're called to worship God. They're, they're trying to worship this other stuff and also get God to give them more. As so we talked about the reality that Idols for us become like this forest where, where we can kind of see God, but that when something starts to change your view of God, when it starts to distort what Scripture says about him to make you think something else about him, it's likely an idol. When it starts to block your vision of what's true. We talk through James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? And I referenced Brad Bigney in Gospel Trees and talking about looking for chaos in your life and in relationships. Looking for the things that, that when that trigger gets pushed, when that button gets pushed, when that light goes off, that it sends you into something that you didn't expect. That maybe there's a reaction that comes from you that surprises other people and they don't understand why it is that you just got so worked up about seemingly something very small. And we said, follow the trail of your time, your affections, and your money. Because where those things go, your heart's usually following. We talked through these heart diagnostic questions that we can ask ourselves that sometimes can be helpful and painful. To be at the place where we're going to be honest enough to say, am I willing to sin to get it? And if your answer to that is always no, you're lying because it's what we do. Anytime we're pursuing after an idol, 
Any time where our attentions and our affections aren't focused on Jesus and they're instead focused on something else, there is sin involved. And we've decided that it is worth sinning in order to achieve that thing every time. See, the root of sin is this. Something that has stolen my attentions and affections from Jesus, period. As we wrestle through some of that, we talk through what would be some practical helps to us as we look to maybe work at our own heart and hopefully work to uh, disciple others. We said uh, to connect with grace before correcting with truth. Connect with grace before correcting with truth. And I kind of used the example of that person who just comes in and just throws something in a person's face that, that it might be very true. It might be exactly the right thing. It could be the right diagnosis and even the right verse of this is what God says about that thing. But if all you're going to do is go in and bash your way around hoping that you're going to cause change, you're not going to actually accomplish anything. And usually you'll do more harm than good. I use the example that, that when the only ham or tool that you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. That there's other tools that we're called to use. That we're supposed to speak the truth in love. That, that, that the truth that we speak should be soaked in grace. We talk through the three T's that are coming from uh, Garrett Higby. Tone, time, and testimony. Check your tone. Are, 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 is what you're saying and the way that you're saying it conveying the same message? We talk through time. Is this the right time to bring this thing up? I use the example of somebody's in a fit of rage and you go up to them and tell them how they're a very angry person. That isn't going to get you very far. It might get you punched, but it's not going to do a whole lot of heart work in the person at that point in time. And last, the idea of testimony. Have you actually shared anything about yourself or your story with this person to even bring them to a place where they might care at all about what you have to say? Do they know that you actually care about them? And have you led in some kind of transparency to get them to even be open in the first place? We talked about not assuming that you already know the answer. Referencing Proverbs 15, 17, and 18, where, where Scripture says that a person who assumes is a fool. Where a person who speaks before they've actually heard is a fool. And how as believers, we don't want to be fools. We want to be faithful. We talk through how that means that when we're listening to somebody, we're listening to understand what they're saying and asking questions to dig deeper into what they're saying as opposed to waiting for them to stop speaking so that you can unload the answer that you already had preloaded. We talk through the reality that, that sometimes as, as we're listening, we're just counting down seconds because all we care about is the thing that we want to say and we actually don't care about that other person at all. We don't care about what they're trying to bring to the table or what they're trying to get off of their heart. They may be opening up in huge ways, and if we're not paying attention, how are we actually going to do them any good? Next, we talk through kind of how the world works through this thing. I said that, that the world really only kind of works in two categories, and, and they don't really have a whole lot of room for working in the eternal. A lot of the world doesn't believe that there's anything eternal about us, that, that when we die, that's it. That when we die, we will rot in the ground, and that is eternity for us. But that scripture has a very different answer for that. And so when the world looks at me and the world looks at you, they only look for two things. They look for your behaviors, and they look for your mood. We talked through how the DSM-5, which is kind of like the, 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 the psychology and psychiatry Bible in a lot of ways, breaks behaviors down into four central categories. It breaks them down into disruptive behaviors, impulsive behaviors, depressive behaviors, and anxiety behaviors. And they'll call them disorders. And we talked through how psychology is not actually like entirely this evil thing that's completely anti-scripture. In fact, psychology is extremely good at identifying a problem. Psychology is very good at looking at the behaviors and the moods that are coming from a person and saying, hey, I think you might be depressed. 
I think there's some anxiety and fear in you. You seem to be pretty impulsive. You seem like, like maybe you're just sitting in despair. You seem like you're just kind of angry and holding things in. Psychology is really good at saying those things. It's just really bad at telling you what to do with it. And so instead of the world helping people process through these things, what it does is it tries to help people make them go away. And the reality is, is we don't need any help. I I do what I do as I pursue idols in my life and in my heart. Everything I do tends to be based around how can I not feel these things that I don't want to feel. I feel anxiety. I don't want to feel anxiety. That's uncomfortable. So I'm going to flee. I'm going to run to something comfortable. I'm going to run to something that will distract me. I'm going to run to something that will make me feel good in the moment. I'm feeling anger. I, I, I don't like the way that anger makes me feel. And so I'm going to try to, to numb that out by maybe watching something funny or, or by taking a couple extra drinks or, or fill in the blank. We run from it. And the reality is is that scripture addresses all of these things. And so so when you see the idea of a disruptive disorder, that lines up with what exactly scripture says about anger. When you see something about an impulsive disorder, that lines up with what scripture calls foolishness. When you see a depressive disorder, that lines up with what scripture says about despair. And when you see an anxiety disorder, that lines up with what scripture calls fear and worry. We talk through the problem that the world ends up facing is that when they give us these descriptors, they start giving us labels. And when you have a label, it starts to work at the basis of your identity. When you have a label that says, I am this, you're no longer functioning in a descriptor of behavior, but you're now functioning in a world where there's been a labeled identity on a person. And we talk through what some possible identity issues might be. I am a sinner. I am broken. I am worthless. I am depressed. I am a person who suffers from an anxiety disorder. I am bipolar. I am an angry person. I am, I am, I am. And the problem with dealing in labels at the level of identity is it means you are a victim. It means that there is no hope of actual change in you because it's who you are. And here's what we know. You can't change who you are. And I can't either. See, that, that's the whole problem that the gospel comes to address. I am broken and lost in sin. And it didn't start with me. It started in the garden back in Genesis chapter 3. And it's been a problem that every person throughout the rest of history has experienced. And then God steps in and gives new identity. We talked through how in in Exodus, when, when you have God speaking to Moses and he comes and he introduces himself as I am, that that is the true agent of label and identity. You see, the world is eager to give you an identity, and God is the only one who gets to do that. And so when he comes in as the I am, he's coming in to make way for us to be this. I am a son of God. I am one of the redeemed. I am chosen and elect. I am washed in the blood of Christ. I have been bought and purchased. I'm an image bearer of God, and I will spend eternity with him. And in that, there's hope for me, and there's hope for you. We talk through the beauty of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where it talks through this list of different sins that people experience. And then it says these beautiful words, and such were some of you. Such were some of you, but God intervened and changed everything. And so here's where we're going. Those four categories that we looked at last week, that idea of disruptive, 
depressive, anxiety, and impulsive, we're going to break down what Scripture says about those and how we actually walk with one another when we're experiencing those things. Because while it is not 100%, most of the time, if somebody is coming to you and they're struggling in some way, it's in one of these categories. And if we're willing to lean into Scripture, if we're willing to put in some time and some relationship value, there can be a whole lot of victory that's seen through what God has promised us in his word and through his church. And so that's where we're going. Tonight we're going to dig into the idea of, of anxiety and fear and worry and how we might respond to one another to give hope through faith and love. People are afraid of a lot of things. I always find it interesting to see the growing list of things that people are afraid of. There's currently a group in Germany that's trying to get the psychological world to add to the DSM-5. Again, that's the psychological psychiatric Bible of symptoms and all things. They're trying to get them to add something to it called nomophobia, which is the fear of not having your phone. And it's like a significant campaign to get that added. And so that kind of gets my mind going of, okay, so what are other things that are, are diagnosable fear? Because that's what the DSM-5 does, is it gives diagnosis for symptom. Here's a few of them. Uh, we have acrophobia, that's a fear of heights. Aerophobia, that's a fear of flying. Arachnophobia, probably obvious, fear of spiders. Astrophobia, the fear of thunder and lightning. We have autophobia, which I would have thought would be the fear of cars. It's not. It's the fear of being alone. Claustrophobia, confined spaces. Hemophobia, the fear of blood. Hydrophobia, the fear of water. And then there's some interesting ones. Electrophobia is the fear of chickens. <laughs> this one is hard to pronounce. It's onomatophobia. It's the fear of names. This one's offensive. P Paganophobia is the fear of beards. <laughs> There's nephophobia, it's the fear of clouds. And cryophobia, which I'm convinced my wife has, is the fear of cold. <laughs> See, there, there, there's all of these things, and these are diagnosable. These are things that you can go to a psychiatrist and walk away with that as part of your diagnosis. That you have a labeled fear of chickens. And if we need to deal at that level, we have a problem. And again, I'm not here to bash psychology. I'm just here to say it's not giving you anything that's going to give you long-term answers or hope. But scripture does. And so then I guess you're left with this question. So we have all these fears. Fear is kind of all around us. In fact, if you're on the news channels for like two seconds, you can see that they make their living off of two things. One, stirring up fear in you, and two, making you angry enough to keep watching. That that's how they make a living. And so when we're looking at like how much fear exists, just think about what's happened over the last year. Think about how most conversations seem to actually be based out of those two emotions, fear and anger, and how quickly people are turning on each other because of it. And so that leaves you kind of with like, well, well, how do we deal with the fact that we feel these things? We don't like to feel these things. Why did God even let us feel them in the first place? Why did God give me the ability to feel fear and anxiety? Did that come with the fall? Was that like part of that package? Like you get mosquitoes, deadly snake bites, and you're going to be scared of stuff? Or, or, or is there something deeper to it? And what I want us to kind of wrestle with to start is, can fear be a good thing? Can anxiety be a good thing? And if it can be, then is it problematic that we do everything we can not to feel it? Can anybody think of something good that fear might do? Yep. Yeah. Teach a child they get burned by fire. Yeah. So a fear of fire because it protects them. It's a healthy Lots fear. Of healthy fear of jumping off the roof of mm -hmm. the garage. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, <laughs> fear is largely what keeps us alive till we hit 30. Yeah. <laughs> then the fact that we can get hurt while sleeping keeps us alive. But until 30, it's fear. Fear is what keeps kids from going into the street. Fear is what makes people afraid of going into the woods because they're going to get eaten by bears. Fear is what makes us realize rattlesnake, not friend. So fear can be good. It's almost like God put that in us on purpose. And I think one that as we look at Scripture, starts to get a little more interesting. The reality that, that Jesus, fully God and fully man, felt fear. That Jesus felt anxiety deeply. If you look at Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, you see a man who's actually kind of at his end. Because fear is real. Just because he was fully God does not mean he was not fully man. And that means that he felt and understood emotions exactly as we do. He just responded to them rightly. And so we see Jesus in the garden, and as he's talking to his disciples, he tells them, he says, I am so wrecked right now. I am so scared right now. Everything in me is twisting right now to the point where I feel like I could die at any second. And over and over, he keeps coming back and seeing that his friends have just kind of forgotten about him, that they've fallen asleep again and again. And most of you have probably heard just kind of the talk through the medical side of Jesus sweating blood as he prayed in the garden, being a, a true and real medical condition that comes from extreme stress for a prolonged period of time. That's anxiety. Every bit of Jesus that is human wanted to run. That's why he's praying to God, God, if there is any other way, let this cup pass from me. And here's the thing. He knew there wasn't because he's Jesus and he's still asking. Jesus felt fear and anxiety. And so is it automatically bad or wrong? I don't think we can say that it is. But more, we're called repeatedly in Scripture to have a proper and right fear of God, to fear the Lord. One of my favorite passages about this comes from Hosea chapter 3. And it says this, it says, In that day, in that day, and this is talking about this redemption of Israel to God. It says, They will fear me, they will fear God, because of his goodness. They will fear him because he is so good. And that kind of changes my definition of fear a bit. Because that's not a, I'm afraid of clowns, which is a very reasonable thing to be afraid of. That's a legitimate respect and awe and reverence for someone who is perfectly good in a way that we can't comprehend or imagine or even know what it would be like to fully experience it. It's something new. So I do think fear can be good. And the reality is, is that as we're going through these different things, these things that the world would call disorders, anger disorders, despair disorders, fear disorders, foolishness disorders. Scripture doesn't always speak negatively about them entirely, except for foolishness. You don't see anything positive about foolishness. Might be something to take from that. But anger we see displayed in Christ. There's a reality in which there are things in our world that should make you angry. It should. When you see abuse it should make you angry. It should. When you see the world reveling in sin, it should break your heart, but it should also bring about a right anger in us. When you see somebody who mocks God, it should bring about a right anger in you. And so as we look at this, 
anxiety is tricky because that's the most medicated thing in our culture. It's the thing that people do the, the most extreme things to not feel anymore. It's the reason why alcoholism is, is so significant. It's the reason why pornography consumption is at an all-time high and always climbing. It's the reason why even when people talk about hating the NFL, they'll still never miss a game. It's the reason why McDonald's is still in business. Because anxiety drives so much in us that we don't realize. And so we run to things to cope. We run to things for refuge instead of running to God. But what if we had a right view of fear? What if we had a right view of fear of God? that change the way that we view him and change the way that we view others? What if a right fear of God caused us to love others well, understanding that, yes, he is perfectly good and merciful, and he's also perfectly just? What if a right fear of God drove us towards evangelism? What if a right fear of God drove, drove us into his arms instead of away from him? Because a right fear of God helps us to understand that he is love and anything outside of him is not. A right fear of God helps us to understand that he is comfort and joy and peace and that it cannot be found elsewhere. And if we try to find it anywhere else, there are horrible ends to that. And scripture talks a lot about fear. In fact, of, of any emotion that you'll see in scripture, fear is by far the most addressed. And the other thing that makes fear tricky is that Fear often kind of masquerades as something else. And so there will be times where you're looking at somebody and you're like, wow, you're an angry dude. And completely missing the fact that that's something that's actually completely driven by fear. And it's not about anger at all. Where you'll see in a person, wow, you just seem desperately sad and like you're sinking in despair. Not understanding that that's not where they're living. Where they're living is terror that something else is going to happen to make it worse. Where, where you see a person, you're like, wow, you're acting really foolish right now. Like, why are you being so impulsive? Because they're trying to cover up the fact that they have incredible insecurities. And they don't know how to handle it. And so they just act wild to try to cover up the fact that they're really hurting inside. I'm trying to keep an eye on the time here. Um, when you think about somebody who's, who's dealing with fear or anxiety... What kind of questions would you say kind of run through that person's head? Like if a person is just kind of paralyzed or crippled in fear, is there something that you, that you would say kind of like would describe that person's mindset? And be willing to take a stab at it? Thinking about something that could happen, mm -hmm. might happen. Yeah, the question of what if that horrible thing happens to me or somebody I love? What about, what if people think poorly of me? What if I make the wrong choice? What if I fail? See, those are questions that we ask not when our hearts are set on loving God and loving others, but when my heart is extremely concerned with me and how I'm perceived and what people think of me and so we live in a world that's super concerned with self-esteem. And it's something that gets preached to every kid in schools from the youngest of ages all the way through. It's why you hear horrible graduation speeches every year talking about you can always achieve your dreams and all you have to do is want it bad enough and you can achieve it. And it's why there's a, a huge subset of our culture that believed that lie and then realized it wasn't true or failed to do it and now think that they're somehow irrevocably broken? What kind of, uh, what kind of fearful questions might a, a person jump to under, under these conditions? Um, how many of you have kids? How many of you have kids that drive? A, few, a little less of you? Okay. 
Say you have a son that just turned 16. They turned 16 today, and they say, hey, all right, I got, uh, I got my license. So mom and dad, how about them keys? They go out and uh, hit the town. First night driving, it's going to be great. And so being a kind and loving parent, you say, well, yeah, that's fine. You can do that. You can have the keys, but don't be dumb. Don't kill anybody, and you have to be home by 10. What starts to go through the mind of a fearful person at 10.05 when their son's not home? Maybe, did they hurt somebody? Maybe, did they get arrested? Maybe, did they get in a horrible car accident? By 10.09, it's, are they dead? Like, it doesn't take long for us to go from something as simple as they're a couple minutes late because they're an immature 16-year-old to the worst of fears of what might have happened. Why? Because we want to control it. And when we can't, it's a problem. What about, what about this? A person who just cares about their job a ton, is an incredibly hard worker, putting in just effort that goes above and beyond all the time. Let's say, I don't know, just for instance, that that person's a pastor. And, and they put a ton of effort into a sermon. They're all in on this thing. They have translated from the original languages. They know that they hit their time perfectly. They didn't go too long or too short. They covered the entire text. Like everything was lined up. They think, I have exegeted this text better than I have ever done before. And then they go out to the lobby afterwards. And it's shaking hands like happens in traditional churches and nobody says anything. It's, hey, pastor. Thanks, pastor. See you next week, pastor. And suddenly the mind goes to this. Was I stuttering the whole time? Do they think I'm a terrible preacher? Did I actually completely miss the point of the text? Was I, was I preaching with the mic turned off? These people have to hate me. They definitely hate me. I need to get my resume ready because I'm probably getting fired on Monday. And see, we spiral into this, this just kind of horrible pit of fear when we have no reason to. Why? Because there is something that we've built up in ourselves of this will never happen to me. And I will work hard enough to ensure that it can't. And I will protect my kid well enough to ensure that they know how to drive well. And I'll get a vehicle that's super safe. And I'll do all these different things. And at the end of the day, we don't have control over what happens in a person's heart any more than we have control over how our 16-year-old manages a vehicle on the road. But we fight for it. And so we have to kind of dig into, first in us and then in others, what are the questions that we might be wrongly asking? Is God good? How could God let this happen? Why won't this person just understand how much I put into this? Why can't I get them to just do what I need them to do so this would never happen again? And we need to start working to turn that to something a little bit more helpful. And Scripture gives us uh, good information to help us do that, which we'll get to after our break. Uh, so go ahead and come back at 10.2, and uh, we will finish up. So as we're, as we're talking about fear, as we're talking about this idea of anxiety and worry, you have to kind of start to dig into where is this thing maybe coming out of? What, 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 is, what is fear based out of? And so if you guys still have this, again, if you don't have a copy of it anymore, I did print off some extra ones. You can grab it off the table over there. But as you go through this, again, this will not cover 100% of every situation that has to do with fear or foolishness or anger or despair, but most of them will end up falling into these categories. Uh, here's what we're not saying to do with this. I'm not telling you to go around to try to diagnose everybody with this piece of paper. Uh, they will not like you. It will be very annoying, and I'm going to have to end up counseling them and you afterwards. So just don't do that. But, but what it's helpful for 
at least for me, a lot of times is just doing some heart work here. Doing some heart work where I need to do it first before I actually start working with somebody else. And so when you look at what it says here about fear, the things that you might see in a person behavior-wise or, or talking fruit-wise that, that will help you maybe see like, okay, where are they hanging out? Where are they dwelling right now? Under fear, you see things like, are they incredibly controlling? And so often, fear will manifest in control because what is fear? It's this constant spiral of what if something happens? Or you might be, maybe you could just label it as what if? What if? And so there will be people who are just paralyzed, who won't make a decision about anything, who will miss all kinds of things because their concern is always, but what if this happens? It's the person who will never go out and get a job or leave their basement because they're like, I can't go out because the terrorist threat level is orange and it's really dangerous out there. It's the person who has a reason to not do anything all the time. It's the person who, who tries to arrange people around them or maybe set the rules for what other people are allowed to do. Why? Because if I can control them, if I can control this, then they can't hurt me. If I can get them to see things the way that I see it, if I can get them to do things the way I want them to do it, I know that's safe because it's what I would do and it's never failed me before. And so we set up these walls out of control, out of wanting to arrange things in a certain way. And when we can't control it, often the next thing that you see on the sheet is that we try to avoid it. We try to avoid it. And so a lot of times people who are very fearful are very manipulative trying to control a situation. When things get out of hand or when there's a discussion they know needs to happen that that's going to be uncomfortable, that goes outside the realm of what I decided I'm okay with, now it's like, hey, they're ghosting you at every turn. This is the person who's like, you're, you're sending them a text like, hey, let's get together for coffee. And they're like, hey, yeah, sure, two weeks from now, maybe. And then you just never hear from them. There's this fear. There's this thing that potentially they're trying to avoid. It's the person where, where you'll hear them make a decision, but then they're really quick to see kind of how you're responding to what they've said. And they're like, well, maybe not, though. Like, I definitely want to go to Carlos Cantina, but I, oh, but I, you know, there's a lot of reasons not to go to Carlos Cantina, but, but maybe we could just go to Holiday Kitchen. Do you like Holiday Kitchen better? I love Holiday Kitchen. Let's go to Holiday Kitchen. It's the second guessing that's, that's not just motivated in did I make the wrong decision, but that's motivated by what do you think of the decision that I've made? It's a fear of people and perception. Fear is rarely based in just some mystical outside force. It's usually based in a relationship. And so you have this idea of people-pleasing. And people-pleasing is something that, that whether you want to say you're there or not, everybody struggles with it. People struggle with it in different ways, but everybody struggles with it. Whether it's the person whose calendar is just insane to the point of being unhealthy because they'll never say no, or it's the person who's trying a new diet fad every month because their appearance to other people is so incredibly important to them. Or it's, it's the person who, no matter what happens, all they ever want to do is make sure everybody else around them is happy. Because if other people are happy, you're safe. Because if other people are happy, you don't have to worry about conflict because you've worked really hard to put out all those fires. And then you're enabling and you're appeasing people instead of actually saying what you think. It says on the sheet, it's a peace faker, not a peacemaker. This person doesn't actually ever deal with a problem. They dance around the problem, trying to control the different pieces. And if they can't, they're the first person gone. Is this thing just got too messy? This just got too intense. This just got too scary for me, and I'm out. That's a fear-based person. And anxiety and fear kind of can lead to, to two things. It is control, 
or it is complete and utter passivity. So it's control, I will do everything, or it's laziness, I will do nothing. Because if I do nothing, then I can't be held accountable for what happened. You see this talked about in the parable of the tenants in Scripture. You see this master who goes to his servants and he says, I'm leaving the country. I'm going to be traveling for a while. And so I'm going to give the three of you these different amounts of money. And you're supposed to go and do something with it while I'm gone. And so he gives 10 to the first one. He gives, uh, what is it, five to the second one. And he gives one to the last one. And the last one, when the master returns, the master's like, great. Like these guys just made me a ton of money while I was gone off of what I gave them. What did you do with it? And the third servant's like, well, so here's the thing. Like, I know that you're a person who reaps where you don't even sow. That means make money where you didn't do work. And, and that, that you are, are very serious about your money. And so I, ha- I just wanted to make sure that no matter what happened, I could give you back exactly what you gave me because I don't ever want to owe and I don't ever want to risk anything and I don't want to take a chance of upsetting you. So here it is. What does the master say to him? Does anybody remember? You wicked, lazy servant. What was he operating out of? Yeah, he wasn't operating out of laziness. He was operating out of fear that was expressed in laziness. Fear often looks like a person who does nothing because they're worried that if they do something, it will be the wrong thing. Mark Twain uh, kind of famously said about fear, he said, My life has been filled with terrible misfortunes, most of which have never actually happened. When you look at Scripture, when we look at fear, fear is, fear is tricky because of what it is at its very essence. Uh, the, in Greek, it's the word merimnao. It's a combination of two words, merizo and nous. Merizo means divided. Nous means mind. And so merimnao literally means a divided mind, a mind set against itself. It's a person who is literally sitting and fighting with himself about, well, I want to do this, but what if this happens? But I could go do that, but that person may not like it. And so they just sit paralyzed, a mind divided. See, we get anxiety because what if something goes wrong? We feel fear because things aren't going just exactly how we want them to go. We try to fix the problem, but we can't. Seems like we just make it worse. And so we run. There's a few different people in Scripture that I think we can look to to see how they dealt with fear. Um, You see fear as early as Adam and Eve in the garden. So Adam and Eve sin. And then what happens? They hide. They hide. And and so the very first response to we blew it is run. Get out of here. Get out of the spotlight. Make sure that you can't be found. Look at, oh, I am full of shame. And so it's hiding. What's Adam's next move? Yeah. It's blaming And that's control. So Adam hides. He's found. Plan A failed. But God, it's the woman you gave me. I mean, it's just a big old bag of sin over here. I didn't stand a chance. And so he hides and he blames. And it's based in fear. Because he knows that things are no longer right between him and God. Going on. There's this guy, he's kind of a big deal, his name's Abraham. You know, father of many nations, etc., etc. And he's got this wife, her name's Sarah. And God made a pretty unique promise to Abraham and Sarah, and it went like this, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you, land, seed, and blessing. You will have many children, and from you, many nations will come. In fact, your offspring will outnumber the stars in the sky and the sand on the shore. So God makes this incredible promise. And then some years go by. 
things are kind of rough. They're like, well, she's getting old, God. I don't know if you noticed. She's like 90. I don't know what to do with this anymore. I don't think this is going to work. I did the math. You're God. I, I think you can do the math. And so it's time to take control because I'm afraid that God isn't actually good. I'm afraid that, that God will not make good on the promises that he's made to me. And so out of fear, what do Abraham and Sarah do? They put Abraham with Sarah's maidservant, and they have a little boy named Ishmael. And fear kind of runs rampant in that family throughout the rest of the family line. Two things that kind of mark the Abrahamic line are fear and deceit. Why? Because when you're afraid, you lie to somehow control the result. And so Abraham has this pattern where he goes into foreign lands and he's got his family with him. And as soon as he gets there, mind you, again, his wife is like 95, 90, whatever. And he's going in, he's like, you know what? I think they're going to think my wife is way too attractive. Uh, I don't think God could handle this. I know we had a son. That was kind of a miracle, but they're like, this just can't work. And so when they go in, he'd say, okay, guys, here's the plan. Family huddle. If anybody asks, Sarah's my sister. And everybody goes with this horrible plan. And sure enough, the king comes in and says, hey, actually, you're right. I do want your, your sister. I'm going to take her to be a part of my harem. And then in a dream, God goes to the king and he's like, hey, tiny king. Hey, little guy. Here's the deal. She's mine. And she belongs to another. And so if you touch her, I'm going to crush you and your entire tiny little nation. And you have this king then who responds rightly in fear to God. So you have Abraham who is doing what is wrong out of fear and a king who does not know Yahweh who responds rightly out of a proper fear of a God who is perfect and holy and just and powerful. And he brings her back and he says, Abraham, how could you do this to me? How could you wish destruction on my entire nation? And Abraham doesn't just do it once, he does it twice. And then his son does the exact same thing. You can see the same pattern in Cain and Abel. You can see it again in Jacob and Esau. See, when our love for God and our love for others isn't centered in the right places, when that's not actually working, fear is one of the fastest things we run to. Fear is one of the fastest things we run to because fear means control. It's when things in our life and in our soul aren't right, we run to something that we think is going to be able to fix it. It causes us to ask questions like this. Can I really rely on God? You know, God is so distant from me. I just don't know if he can, if he can handle this. But if I can control enough of my environment, if I can control enough people around me, maybe just in my family, and so that's the person who out of fear is a person who's going to snap in a second, and everyone in the family knows it, so they're walking on eggshells around that person. But that person has a felt sense of control because nobody's going to cross them. And we say it's because of love. We think of others, do, do they like me? Will that person hurt me? And so instead of loving God, we decide that we can't trust him. Instead of loving others, we assume that they're against us. And so we go into self-protection. We go into this desire to kind of just appease everybody to make sure that we're going to be safe at all times. See, it's, it's dangerous when, when we take an emotion that God has given us, the ability to feel. And if we either try to numb it out and not feel it, it is to our peril. Or if we choose to dwell in it and never move from it, it does the same thing. Fear is going to cause us to have a wrong view of God. It's going to cause us to have a wrong view of other people. And so what do we do? 
Because the reality is, is that for some people probably in this room, that is something that is paralyzing us today. And if we're honest, all of us are there at least a little bit. And the reality is, is that all of us are in relationships with people who are experiencing the same thing. So what, what do we do? What do we do if, if we're trapped in this spiral of fear and anxiety? Or if we know somebody else who is, and maybe we kind of, we're starting a relationship with them, we've known them for a long time, but we've been too afraid to go there because we're afraid that they're afraid. Here's what you don't do. Something that Christians are notorious for that does a ton of damage and almost never, ever helps is this. Step one. Oh, you're struggling with that? Oh, yeah, fear is tough. That's, that's tricky. I'll pray for you. That's step one, and it fails every time. Because chances are you will not pray for them. And you saying that you'll pray for them was as good as saying good luck. It's as good as good luck. The other thing that we love to do as Christians is this. Oh, yeah, fear. Yeah, um, I read about that in the Bible. Here, I have these two verses. And so take these and call me in the morning. Or, better yet, let these fix you and don't call me because talking about this makes me uncomfortable. And so we love to throw out these ideas that make us feel like we've done something as a Christian, that make us feel spiritual or religious, that look like I'll pray for you when we probably won't, and that look like take these verses as a magic pill and don't let me get any of the mess on me. That does damage. What a fearful person doesn't need is thinking to themselves, there's another person who said they're going to pray for me, and they're not going to. What a fearful person needs is to see something that is radical from Scripture, from a brother or sister in Christ who takes what Scripture says to us about how we interact with one another seriously. They need a brother or sister in Christ who sees that God tells us in our, his word to love one another and to comfort one another. And we actually care to do it. It's not about giving somebody a verse and a text message and running away. It's about actually saying to that person, I care about your mess. And I feel the tension because I'm in it too. And so, hey, can we spend some time together regularly and can we just study this theme in Scripture? Because you're talking about some fear, and, and if I'm honest, I have it at different places in my life too. And I think that we could grow together in how we biblically deal with fear. That's where you're going to see transformation happen. It's when we're actually willing to walk with each other when the hurt and pain that is a part of fear actually seemed important to us. Because it is. Because we recognize that this is an eternal soul that we're interacting with. That this is a person made in God's image who has great value and worth to our king. And they're worth our time. is being willing to help a person walk through what what hope and and faith come to us from the gospel. Helping a person to walk through fear with an understanding that there is an ultimate king who is sovereign and in control and cares for them at the deepest level. Helping them to understand that they don't have to live in fear about what everyone else is going to think or if they're going to fail or if they're going to get it right or not because their eternity was never based on their performance to begin with. It's based on Jesus' perfection. And having a brother or sister in Christ who care enough about you to regularly remind you about the truths of the gospel and who Jesus is and what he's done in your life 
that's where changing power exists. It's about people who are willing to enter into this thing with each other to help each other remember that we serve a God who is unchanging and constant. A God who doesn't let us down. A God who doesn't change his opinion about us. A God who doesn't stop loving us because we didn't live up to his expectations. But a God who stays constant. Like we see in Malachi 3.6, it says, I, the Lord, do not change. And my favorite part about that verse is what comes next. It says, therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. God is saying, I'm faithful when you're not. You aren't faithful. I'm faithful. You're saved because I am good, not because you're good. That's a God who chases out false fear. Because fear is so based in, what if I mess up? Or what if others mess up or hurt me? And when we have an understanding of a God who is the gospel, we have an understanding of the God who is unchanging and constant, that changes how we're actually able to view the world and interact in it. And it means that living faithfully looks different than it did when we were just trying to hide from God and everybody else. Uh, there's, there's a lot of scripture on fear. Um, we're going to wrap it up here, but if you're like, hey, I just need an arsenal of scripture about fear, I'm happy to give you that list as long as you promise me that your next move is not going to be to like a parachute drop in a couple text messages about a verse to somebody and never speak to them again. But if your goal and it is, I need to soak in this truth and I need to do the same with others, we got something to talk about. God cares about fear. God cares about anxiety. And he fully knows and understands it and can redeem it in us. And I think that that's a good first step as we're looking at how do we work with one another in discipleship. If you guys have questions, comments, concerns, cheap shots, come let me know. Um, I'm going to quickly pray for us and we're going to be done. <sighs> Father God, help us to remember that you are the God who is perfect in a love that casts out fear. That you are the God who is constant and, un and unchanging and, and the God who even when we are at the place of not fully believing or trusting in your goodness, you still show it to us. The God who, who cares when we've been hurt by others and calls us to continue to pursue them. And the God who ultimately holds us in his hands and sustains our every breath. God, help us to be a people who care deeply about fear and anxiety in others. Help us to be a people who recognize that in ourselves and the different ways that it shows up and choose to run into your arms instead of running to something else. God, we, we want to see change. And so we're asking that you start here. In your name, amen. All right, thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week.